Hi everyone. Today is the 27th of January 2018 and I'm going to talk about debunking the myth that obstetricians are running around with knives in their hands waiting to do a cesarean and they're really out to get you. As I wrote in the description, this started with a book called Silent Knife and the Rise of Cesareans. And the Rise of Cesareans occurred, as I talked about in a previous debunking um, video, because the, the medical profession was shifting to fill the needs of what the consumers were saying. And this is complicated for a lot of people. Cesareans, when I gave birth in 1970, it was a four, I've just looked it up, 4.5% cesarean rate. That isn't a lot. But people have to understand what the medical profession was like because things have changed a great deal. Women were given a classical cesarean, which meant their uterus was cut up and down, and so was their belly, which left them with a disfiguring scar. It was at the same time that fashion was changing and bikinis became popular. And so women wanted to wear bikinis. They didn't want to be left with this ugly scar. They wanted to still be beautiful after the birth. And for women who had had cesareans, and those were considered to be absolutely the most essential life-saving surgery, that people were glad that they lived in a medical a society that had medical care that could even do that. Um, and then things changed. The medical profession said, okay, we hear you. And they developed what's called the bikini cut. I mean, that tells you something. Or the low-lying cesarean. Well, it turned out that that was actually more beneficial, both to the mother and to the baby, because women who, had, who now had previous cesareans could seek what was called a trial of labor, or now called a VBAC, or a vaginal birth after a cesarean. And... Culture began to change. This was the period of time in the 70s, in the late 70s and the 80s and the 90s, where the medical profession around the world began to be more available in what's called third world countries. And as I mentioned in a previous talk, when the World Health Organization took a look at the what they considered to be um, a legitimate rate of cesareans, it was 3% at that point. They were basically saying 97% of women can give birth fine. And then at a conference that I went to in 1984, WHO was reconsidering that because women in South American countries that became socially upwardly mobile were choosing cesareans because of the bikini cuts availability because they didn't want to damage their vaginas. Because there was a reality about giving birth vaginally, a lot of women ended up with damaged vaginas. They ended up with incontinence. They ended up with flabby vaginal muscles that impacted their pleasure having intimacy and their partner's pleasure having intimacy. And some tore and some, it was painful to have sex afterwards. So women knew this. So they, when the medical profession came into third world countries and said, you can have a cesarean, we won't leave a scar in your belly, you can time when you're going to give birth, you don't have to go through the pain of labor and suffer like your mothers and grandmothers and everybody before you have from long births and very painful births, women raised their hands and said, yes. Yeah. So the WHO said, <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> we're going to change what we consider to be a normal rate of cesareans, which is now 10 to 15%. In China, there's a 50% cesarean rate. In the United States, a 32%. In New Zealand, where I live, which has a midwifery-led maternity system, which is a partnership with women, in which every woman has a continuity of care, direct entry midwife, and midwives in hospitals can still have their own clients, the cesarean rate has risen from 12.9% to almost 30%. So there's this huge disconnect between <clears throat> everything, as far as I can tell. So are doctors going around trying to encourage you to have a cesarean? Well, there are a lot of women choosing a cesarean. So when the natural birth movement said women should have choice, because there was this huge sort of original sin in childbirth. And there's no blame and shame and guilt about this because 
really, honestly, this people didn't have the foresight about the decision that was made early on. So the original sin was first when Grantley, Dick Reed, Lamaz, and Bradley, three caring male obstetricians, developed their skills-focused methods that people used from the 50s through the 70s. They focused on those women only who wanted a natural birth, a pain-free labor, and a normal birth. That was the original sin because that not enough women achieved that, even trying that. So therefore, birth advocates in the 70s and 80s said skills don't work to achieve this normal, natural, less medical birth. And so therefore, we should have choice. Women should be able to choose. And the implication was a narrow, was narrow choice. The women should be able to choose to say no to medical care that they all lumped into the word interventions with the implication that all medical interventions were imposed on women and unnecessary. What they didn't understand was that women were choosing medical care around birth because one is they still had a memory that women suffered in labor, so they didn't want to feel pain. They just didn't want to be knocked out. So they wanted the medical profession to develop a pain relief that allowed them to be present but not feel pain. And guess what? We have it. It's called an epidural. When I gave birth, we didn't have epidurals. So they gave you things like pethidine or other things like that. And, and before that, they gave you scopalamine and things like that. So the medical profession has listened to the demands of women. So when the choice focused trend of childbirth came into effect at the end of the 70s, the belief was that if women knew what kind of birth they wanted, they would all choose natural births. Well, that wasn't true because there are, it's really the natural birth movement, even though they're very loud and they're very effective politically, because that's what drove the midwifery model of care in New Zealand. They are actually a very small percent of birthing women. Most women are fine with the medical care. They don't like every bit of it. They don't always like how people treat them. But most people in modern cultures are not willing to say, when I am pregnant and giving birth, that is the one area of my life where I would like hands-off medical care. They're just not going to do it. So the medical profession, the obstetrical part of the medical profession, is has a relationship with the consumers that use that service. And the consumers are saying, when you give them choice, it's true in New Zealand, when you gave them choice, I want more cesareans. I want more epidurals. So when we think that the medical profession is out to get us, we have to consider our role in this. From a birthing better viewpoint, we don't care what you do or want or have in your birth. We just want you to have skills. That's it. We want you to think about birth as an activity you have to do and that any activity is best done when you have a good set of skills that you and your partner or other share so that you can work through your baby's birth journey. So the question then becomes, if women love the modern medical care and they, they do seek it out, or else there would be this massive exit out of the hospital into home births, which there never has been, not even in New Zealand, where it's legal. At the highest point in New Zealand, when midwives took over maternity care, the home birth rate was slightly under 10%, and now it's down to 5%. So women are choosing to go to hospitals. Would it be nice if there were more maternity hospitals and more birth centers? Sure there would. But I can't impact policy. So I'm telling you as the director of Common Knowledge Trust, become skilled and birth your baby because your baby's going to have to be born at some point if you're pregnant. So the other aspect is whether more, the cesareans are performed for non-medical reasons. And the answer flat out to that is yes, absolutely yes. We cannot honestly believe that in China, 50% of mothers or babies would be seriously injured or dead if they didn't have a cesarean. Or in the United States, 32%. Or in New Zealand, 30%. Or the 28%. WHO says 10 to 15% cesareans are normal. They're not saying that only 85% of women would give birth 
that normally and healthily without them, what they're saying is they accept the premise that some women want to have elective cesareans for non-medical reasons. And that, that's the way it is. So does the medical profession perform non-medically demanded cesareans? Yes, they do. And why do they do that? Because, and I'm going to raise my hand here, because there is no societal expectation that expectant mothers and fathers become skilled. That leads to what happens, which is a delay in first stage. Women don't dilate effectively. Babies don't come down through the pelvis effectively. Delay in second stage. Babies don't come out the birth canal effectively. Third reason, women don't cope with the natural occurring pain and they look like they're suffering. So the medical profession that has always been a caring profession, whether you like them or not, will do a cesarean. You'll have a cesarean if your labor goes on and on and on and on and you don't dilate and you don't dilate and you don't dilate and you're looking stressed and you're looking exhausted and you can't bear it anymore. They will do a cesarean if you push for X numbers of hours. That might be two hours. That might be four hours. But they know statistically that a baby is more likely to have a problem if it doesn't deliver. And if you're constantly battering its head against tight crotch, this should tell us skills, 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 skills. My goodness. Coping with pain. That should tell you the lack of skills. If we can't cope and manage labor pains, we have no skills. That should tell us that. And so, what can you do to forward this new childbirth trend that should be skills-focused and choice-supported? Why should it only be really choice-supported? Because a lot of people are choosing more medical care. That's fine. They should still be skills. A lot of choices change unexpectedly. That happens, sorry, but you should still be skilled because those are the things you can use. Many women choose things that they actually don't even want when the birth unfolds. That's fine, sorry. Be skilled, do you get it? It's an activity, it's an activity. Now there are definitely people in the medical profession that get tired, they get worn out, they're not always cordial okay but on the other hand there are a lot of women who are in birth who interpret behaviors toward them in ways that actually when you're a third party person you don't see it particularly about their partners okay their partner tries to help and the woman goes don't touch me get out of my face what's she interpreting and she will remember that but she won't remember that that father or other approached her with kind compassion. And this is a problem. This debunking the myth about obstetricians out to get you are putting total responsibility on the medical profession to provide each individual woman with the best experience she wants, which means that we as pregnant women do not see that obstetrician or midwife. Honestly, I live in New Zealand where everybody has a midwife and they have a partnership with women that they say to women, what do you want and what do you expect of me? They expect nothing of women. And women in New Zealand, since I've been here since the 90s, do not see that midwives have families they do not see that midwives are attending between 40 to 80 births a year and they have clients they're seeing prenatally in the birth in which they and they give 24 7 care and six weeks afterwards so each individual pregnant woman sees it's me 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 pregnant women lack generosity of spirit because the focus is on them so if you don't want a cesarean, say no. Simple as that. If you feel that your baby is at risk or you are at risk, you then have a choice. We all have to live with the repercussions of the choices we make. 
whether we say no or yes. But honestly, I've been involved in birth for 45 years. There are some, some jerks out there. Very, very, very few. There can be a lot of tired obstetricians and midwives. There are a lot more of those. They can ha be, feel very rushed. They can be working within the context of the hospital environment that has other people often using the surgical space. They don't often have designated maternity operating suites. So you need to understand that the obstetricians are there to safeguard your health and well-being, just as midwives are. The difference is that midwives are not highly medically trained to the level that an obstetrician is. And if you need that higher level of medical training, you should be glad that you live in a country where it's available to you. And if you don't like how people have treated you during the birth, you have the right to write a letter to that person and explain it. However, if you live your life based on somebody not being pleasant to you, gee, think about that in reality. Because there are a lot of people in my life who have not been pleasant to me. And that isn't just the, necessarily an obstetrician. If they're hurried, they're hurried. That's what you're dealing with. So become skilled. So you can say, screw you. I'm going to just skillfully birth my baby. And when you do that, you stop focusing on them and you focus on what you are doing to actively birth your baby. So share these videos, like our, our Facebook page, purchase the resources, give them as a gift. They're online lessons. You will become highly skilled. We market to women to target fathers-to-be because men develop these skills equally with women. And it is important that if we want to share in our parenting, that both of us go through pregnancy and birth with a good set of skills that we can use to communicate together no matter what's happening. And make comments on these posts so that we can have a dialogue because Facebook values social media where people are commenting. And share this to other groups in social media so that we become more known, so that I am not just talking to a vacuum. All right, talk to you later to debunk another myth. Bye-bye.